Here we go. Welcome everyone to the November 2021 meeting of the Memphis Astronomical Society. I'm your host, Jeremy Veldman. And once again, again, we've got a great program for you tonight. The James Webb Space Telescope is launching next month and there's some cutting edge research that's about to come out of it. And tonight's speaker is gonna give us a presentation on work that he's doing in the research of active galactic nuclei and galactic winds. So stick around, this is gonna be a very informative talk. But before we get started, just a few preliminaries here. Got some club business to take care of tonight. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen here a sec. Okay. So again, we're the Memphis Astronomical Society, and we are a nonprofit public service organization promoting interest in education in astronomy and related sciences. And you can check us out on our website, memphisastro.org. We're also on social media. We have a Facebook group, and we're on Twitter and also, of course, YouTube. So if you haven't already, please take a second to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Once again, I wanna say thank you to the over 2000 subscribers that we have. Community continues to grow. And once again, I hope you get a lot of value out of tonight's meeting. Again, our, our, our website is memphisastro.org. And if you would like to be added to our email notification list, or if you'd like to join our community, just simply click the join button. It's in the upper right. And also the lower right, you just see the join button there. And when you click on that, it brings up a separate form and just fill out your details. And we send email notices out about once a week regarding upcoming meetings or outreach events. You got a lot going on again this month. So yeah, if you're not a member of our community already and you'd like to be added to our email list, just click the join button on our website, memphisastro.org. And you can also go to mas.com into your name and email. So either way, That'll get you on our email notification list, but it's probably best just to go to our website, memphisastro.org. All right, it's November, it's fall. And once again, we've got an, an active month of outreach. Piece. And tonight's meeting, of course. Now, tomorrow night is our semi-annual Village Creek Star Party. This is a big one. And it was originally scheduled for October the 2nd, but of course, we've been clouded out had a lot of cloudy weather this year. Weather looks favorable tomorrow and it looks so and we do this twice a year weather pending. We haven't done it now for a couple of years because we were shut down last year due to COVID and also uh, weather conditions haven't been favorable. So if you're local to Memphis and you have the opportunity tomorrow night would be a great opportunity to come out to this event. So this is going to be at the Village Creek State Park um, near Wynn, Arkansas. And we, we've sent detailed documentation out on this already throughout the course of the week. I'll send it out again tomorrow once we make the official go, no-go notice. But um, essentially just show up. <laughs> um, we have you know a list of protocols for telescope operators and guides. If you have a telescope and you can bring it out tomorrow, we'll take it. I'm sure we have enough telescope operators, but uh, we can always we can always use more. So the more the merrier. And if if you don't have a telescope and you just want to show up and enjoy the night skies, absolutely by all means come out. And we will have an indoor program at seven o'clock, a little after seven o'clock, and then after about eight thirty or so, then we'll head out to the observing site and do some observing. So the documentation gives you directions on how to get there and then also kind of the timeline for the itinerary. So this is a structured event. Now, as far as where it's located, it's essentially due west along I-40 toward Little Rock, about an hour outside of Memphis. So the city, which is exit 242 off of I-40. Now we, a group of us typically meets at Delta Q Barbecue in Forest City around 545 for dinner. So you're free to come out and do that if you want to come out a little early. So that'll be at 545. Again, Delta Q barbecue. And then just before seven o'clock, we'll, we'll leave and head up to 
the uh, the Village Creek State Park near Wynn, Arkansas, which is where the event is. So, but the bottom line is be at the visitor center around seven o'clock at Village Creek State Park near Wynn, Arkansas. And that's where it's going to be. Should be able to plug it into your GPS. But again, we do have documentation that we're going to be sending out. We have been sending this out throughout the course of the week. So we'll have detailed instructions on how to get there. And again, the indoor program will be, it'll start a little after seven o'clock, about 7.15 or so. And then uh, that's going to be actually by Dr. Ann Viano. She's going to do the indoor program, including um, presentation on sky charts, constellations, things of that nature, as well as some of the objects we're going to be viewing. And then the telescope operators will get set up between 7 and 8, 8.30. And then around 8.30, we'll dismiss from the visitor center and head out to the observing site. So again, that is tomorrow night, November the 6th. Weather's looking great. We've had cloudy skies for a long time. It's nice to get back out and do some observing. We haven't done this actual event for about two years now. So now, if you can bring a telescope, I would just say show up and bring it. We'll take it. Uh, if, you, uh, if you haven't already, email Mark Matthews and just let him know that you're coming. But uh, whether you're bringing a telescope or whether you're just showing up, or if you can be a guide, either way, come on out. Uh, we're hoping this is going to be a great event. It should be a great event tomorrow night. Going to be cold, so make sure you bundle up. You know, don't show up in a spring jacket and shorts. This is November. So make sure you dress warm, you know, put the thermal underwear on, make sure you got the MAS sweatshirt. Uh, it, can get, it can get cold real quick when you're out there, but uh, this, should be, this should be a great event. So again, we'll send the final notice out tomorrow, but that is our main outreach event for the month. That's our Village Creek Star Party. Next week, we have another outreach event at German Shire Park, and this is gonna be a smaller event. We do these for libraries, schools, any type of local in-town community outreach. So again, uh, we're just looking for a handful of telescope operators. I'm planning to be there if it's clear, but if uh, a, few, a few of you wanna show up for this, we'll send notices out about this as well. And again, that's uh, next, uh, whatever day it is, Wednesday or Thursday. I'm losing track of my days here, November the 12th. I guess it's a Friday, because today is the sixth. No, it's a Thursday. Today is the, no, today is the fifth. Five and seven is 12. So it'll be one week from today, which is the 12th. So next Friday. So if you're interested, um, we'll send notices out about this as well. And then on November the 13th, so that's a week from tomorrow, that's next Saturday, we're planning to be at Shelby Farms again. And we do this once a month around the time of the full moon, give or take. So we do dark sky observing around the time of the new moon. And then when the moon gets a little brighter, we'll do in-town events like this, where we look at the moon and the planets. And once again, it's not only an opportunity for outreach, but if you have a telescope and you would like help learning how to set it up and use it, we will have experienced MAS people on hand to help you out. So this is an opportunity for you to get a little mentoring if you need some assistance with your telescope. We typically do that before the actual observing. So again, that's next Saturday, November the 13th. We're falling back tomorrow. So reminder, this is uh, you know that time period when we fall back. So tomorrow night for our Village Creek Star Party, we actually get an extra hour of observing. So reminder. So after that, our observing sessions will be able to start a little bit earlier between five and six because it gets darker earlier. So Anyway, uh, that's next Saturday, November the 30th, or I'm sorry, November the 13th. Now, if you're interested in outreach from the Memphis Astronomical Society, we do have a form on our website and you can just write where it says schedule talk, oops, and fill out and this just really helps us know how we can staff your requested event. So, you know, how big it is, what you're looking for, whether it's an indoor presentation or just observing and any, any information you can provide us. So again, we have an outreach team now that's been, been helping us stay organized and, and uh, fulfill these requests. So yeah, if you're interested in outreach from the Memphis Astronomical Society, just go to our website, memphisastro.org. And in the upper right, you'll see schedule talks and telescopes. 
and just fill out your details and we will be there. We'll show up again if it's clear. And speaking of outreach, again, we had another great month. So we did this event about mid-October. We were actually doing double duty this night. About mid-October, we had one group at Shelby Farms doing what we traditionally do each month. And then a group of us went to the South Haven Library. So special thanks to Ann, Mylan, Brian, Rick, Rebecca for, for helping out with this event. Had a great turnout and it's always a thrill to share the night skies with people who've never looked through the eyepiece of a telescope before. So we, uh, we actually had a very good month in October for outreach. All right, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge some of our new members. And once again, I won't put you on the spot by calling you out, but I did wanna mention you and uh, thank you for joining the Memphis Astronomical Society. So Hazley Smith, you last month, welcome as well as David Earl Ray, Melanie Melligan, and Douglas Mackey. So those are our new members for the month. And I wanna welcome you and say thank you. And again, hope you get a lot of value out of being a part of our community. And I also wanna give a shout out to Sarita Joshi and Steve Wright for, for the work they've done on the Meteor Wright, our newsletter. One of the benefits of being a member is you get access to our newsletter each month. And they put a lot of work into this, gathering the content, organizing it, and editing. So it's come a long ways. Um, we have some talented people in our organization now um, that are, have, have, have been contributing their time and their energy on the board. So Meteorite looks great. You guys have done a great job. Again, special thanks to Sarita and Steve for the work that you're doing to to uh, improve and continue to refine our newsletter. And you get access to this as a, as a member of the Memphis Astronomical Society. All right, I also wanna mention this in case you're aware or not aware, I should say, we do have a lunar eclipse coming up later this month. And that's actually November 18 and 19. Now this is not a 100% lunar total lunar eclipse but it's very close and it's basically going to be overnight of november the 18th november the 19th and it's gonna be 97 percent total which is pretty pretty good i mean it's close enough for government work right and of course a lunar eclipse occurs when the earth or i'm sorry the moon slips behind the earth's shadow so if you look at line of sight uh, the earth comes between the moon and the sun we don't see this every month because the, the moon's plane, orbital plane, is tilted at about a five degree angle with respect to the Earth's orbital plane around the sun. But every once in a while, there's a unique lineup and we can see this. And it's really cool to see the color changes on the surface of the moon when it's uh, slipping into totality. Uh, it just really looks like a, a spherical world. And you just see the oranges and the reds and all the different colors on the surface of the moon. So. Now you got to stay up for this one. It's going to be, it starts at 1.18 a.m. Central time. That's when it uh, begins to enter the, the, the moon begins to enter the Earth's shadow. And then maximum eclipse is actually at three o'clock in the morning. And then uh, it ends at seven. And again, the time. So essentially November 18, November 19. So it's early morning, November 19. I believe that's a Friday, two weeks from today. So if you're interested and you can stay up, maybe get a day off of work that Friday, check this out. This will be a almost total lunar eclipse. And this is an event that you can view from your driveway or your backyard. You don't need to be at a dark sky site to see, to see a lunar eclipse. And binoculars are great for this too. So check it out. Okay, I'll briefly mention this. Um, I did mention this at, at a previous meeting, some of the teams that we're looking to form here. Of course, the outreach team has already been formed and they are doing a tremendous job of organizing and scheduling outreach events. A um, Couple of updates here on some of the other teams that we're working on. And specifically, I wanna focus on team legacy. And again, you're looking at a picture here that was taken all the way back at the beginning in 19 when our organization was first founded. And uh, Steve has actually done some work, Steve Wright, into digging in and, and uh, organizing some of the, 
the archives of the Memphis Astronomical Society and making it available to us to, to, to research. And uh, he's come across some interesting things, including this document right here, which I thought I'd take care. And this is a document entitled The History of the MAS from 1952 to 1982 by John C. Flippin. And again, this is essentially the first 30 years of existence of the Memphis Astronomical Society, and it's a handwritten document. 11 pages. And I thought I'd just share just a couple of segments here. And I'll do my best to read the, uh, the handwriting. Basically says, presented by John C. Flippin to the Memphis Astronomical Society at CBC Science Building, January the 8th, 1982. History of the Memphis Astronomical Society from, 1980, uh, from 1952 to 1982. The history began late in 1952 at the home of John Bueller. Uh, and he gives his address, with meetings of several boys ages 14 to 18 who organized the Teenage Astronomy Club. Requirement, interest in astronomy, weekly meetings in prefabricated garage in, in Bueller's backyard. Had five telescopes, two 45X and 100X refractors, 260X and 125X reflectors, cut show tripod mold criterion four inch, and then one homemade six inch reflector, 200X, 200 power. A payment was considered to build a 10 inch reflector driven by clockwork, observations, moon, planets, double stars, nebulae, John Bueller, president, Bob Ritter, vice president, and then Tom Hartzog was the treasurer. In 1953, with 10 members organized with name, Memphis Astronomical Society got coverage in the commercial appeal Wednesday, August the 12th, 1953, uh, connection with observation of Perseid meteor shower, five illustrations and 17 meteors of story by uh, Lion, Lydell Sims, I think is his name. And then it talks about on October 24, 1953, a charter of incorporation was granted to the Memphis Astronomical Society. And then it continues from there. So you are looking deep into the archives, a handwritten document archiving the origins of our society back in 1953. And essentially the first 30 years of existence in a handwritten document, 11 pages long. So Fascinating, fascinating to see this. And of course, this is why we have to continue to preserve and acknowledge the legacy of this organization. We're just one small ring, rung, if you will, in a much bigger, much bigger chain. And I did mention this last month, but we didn't record the meeting. So I'll go ahead and just briefly mention it here. Of course, we lost John Bueller a couple months ago. He passed away in September of uh, 2020. 2021. He was the first president and one of the original founders at age 84. And you can see him in the lower right there as a teenager in the backyard forming the Memphis Astronomical Society in 1953. So quite a legacy, quite a history. And it's both humbling and exciting to be, to be a part of it, to be, to be some small part of this. So if you are interested in being involved, again, we are looking for not just board members. Um, we're looking for all members, anybody who we have a lot of talented people within our organization, within our community. So it doesn't have to be a firm commitment, just anything that you can contribute that can help us grow and expand. Uh, we've had a lot of great contributions already this year, but just shoot me an email and we would be happy to, to uh, slot you in a position that will that will not only help us, but will, will help fulfill your, your desires and needs to contribute. So anyway, this will be Okay, before I turn the meeting over to the chairman of the uh, nominating committee, I just wanna mention a couple of things briefly here. So I did take a second before this meeting tonight to dig into the bylaws and just kind of uh, thought I'd just share a, a brief segment of this just to kind of refresh everyone's memory. And, you know, it's, it's, it's good for me too. You know, when you're president of an organization, you should 
you should read the bylaws and be familiar with the bylaws. Not sure I've ever actually read through every line in the bylaws, but it is fall. It is uh, elections month. So I thought I would just share this briefly as a refresher, not only for myself, but for everyone else. And uh, this comes right out of the bylaws. You never know what's in the bylaws until you read them, right? The Board of Directors, Section 1. The Board of Directors of the Memphis Astronomical Society shall consist of a president, a vice president for programs, a vice president for observing, a secretary, a treasurer, and five directors. The Board of Directors shall consist of 10 persons, i.e. no two offices or directorships or any combination thereof may be held simultaneously by the same person. Section 2. The candidates for the board shall be selected from the membership by a nominating committee of three members in good standing appointed by the president in the month of October. After the nominees have agreed to run for the various positions, the chairman of the nominating committee shall announce the nominees at the general meeting in November. At this time, additional nominations from the floor shall be in order. If at all possible, there must be at least two candidates for each of the offices of president, vice president for programs, vice president for observing secretary and treasurer, and at least eight candidates for directors. Candidates may run for, but not occupy more than one office. Section six, duties of board, mem uh, board members. President, he shall be chairman of the board and shall preside at, at all general meetings and board meetings. He shall make all decisions requiring the board of the board, he shall perform all duties normally required by the office of president, and he shall have unrestricted access to the MAS private jet. Section B, the vice president for programs shall, shall preside in the absence of the president or in his inability to preside or at the pleasure of the president and shall suggest programs for coming meetings at the board meetings. The vice president for observing shall call all observing sessions and notify the members thereof. Each vice president shall perform any other duties delegated by the president. The vice president for observing shall have free and unrestricted access to any member's telescope at any time without knowledge or consent, including plain wave observatories. Secretary, he shall keep the minutes of the board meetings and read them at the following general meetings. He shall prepare and distribute to all members notices of meetings, elections, referenda, and any other functions of the society. If the society is a member of a national or international astronomy organization, such as the Astronomical League, the secretary shall maintain correspondence with and submit any dues to that organization. He shall notify the news media of the functions of the society. He shall engage in any other necessary correspondence with other astronomical societies or individuals. The secretary shall never be allowed to resign. He, she plays a role that is critical to the survival of the organization. Treasurer, he shall keep an accurate account of the financial transactions of the society and present a statement of all such transactions for each month to the board of directors for approval. He shall submit the annual income tax report as required by article two. He shall notify the members when dues are due and when members are not in good standing. He shall maintain an up-to-date roster of members. He shall pay all bills justly accrued by the society. He shall submit a yearly treasurer's report to the members in January. He shall be entitled to one annual trip to Tahiti, all expenses paid on behalf of the MES membership as compensation for his troubles. <laughs> okay then. <laughs> So my question to you is, do you want to run for office? This is your chance. Everything is in play. Everything is fair game. And with that, I will turn it over to Rick, who's the chairman of the nominating committee. Thank you, Jeremy. I'll uh, grab the screen from you for just a minute. And let's see which screen shall I share. All right, I think I'm, um, am I sharing a uh, slide of the nominations? So uh, good. good evening, I'm Rick Honey. I'm the treasurer of the Memphis Astronomical Society and the chairman of the nominating committee. And uh, this year we have uh, some, uh, what, what we do in our, 
<laughs> what we've had to do in the nominating committee for a number of years now is to uh, really try to reach out to people to see who might be interested in, in helping with these duties and responsibilities of our organization and um, try to get some folks to volunteer. And this year, and, and trust me, any of these um, officer or uh, board positions are, you, you know, you're welcome to uh, uh, run for one of them uh, just because someone has decided they would uh, continue to volunteer their time and effort in that position doesn't mean that it's a given. So uh, this year, Jeremy has agreed and consented to continuing to serve as the president of the MAS for 2022. Mark Matthews has done so as well as vice president of observing. Rick Honey has um, uh, decided that he's gonna be treasurer at least until he gets it right. Uh, Cause I hate doing anything uh, poorly. <laughs> so I'm gonna do it till I get it right. Uh, Sarita Joshi has uh, agreed to continue in the uh, treasury of uh, secretary. And uh, Freddie has uh, uh, agreed to hold the title of VP of programs. And um, let me, and Andriano, uh, who joined our board last year, is continuing on with us, and so is Steve Wright. Let me say that the addition of Ann and Steve Wright and Sarita coming back on the board, uh, you know, we always appreciate all the work everybody does, but we have really made some uh, huge improvements this year in our outreach activities, our ability to perhaps respond to those uh, outreach requests. And uh, I'm, really, I'm really proud to be uh, affiliated with this group of folks that are uh, interested in sharing uh, what we have to, uh, what we enjoy with our astronomical um, hobby. Uh, we have, uh, Merrill Miller, who has uh, uh, joined our organization last year, the year before, and is uh, pretty deeply involved in our uh, astrophotography group and uh, or, uh, efforts. He's a superb astrophotographer himself, has uh, volunteered or at least been coerced into uh, 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 running for a board position. Uh, Andrew Ward. Uh, and a relatively new member, and I don't believe I know Andrew, not personally yet, but Andrew has uh, volunteered to be uh, occupy one of the board positions. And that we, at this time, we don't have uh, the last board position uh, filled or, or someone slated for it. So, uh, I think at this time, I'd like to open the, the meeting to nominations from the membership. Now, the, the, the deal with uh, nominating is uh, you must be a uh, member and pay dues uh, to nominate someone or yourself. And that person you nominate must also be a member in good standing, as we say, and also have, uh, uh, and also be willing to, of course, assume the position. These start in January and run for the year, and uh, that's all I've got. So would anybody like to uh, make a nomination for um, any of these officer or board positions? Looking for hands, unmute yourself and yell out, scream loudly. So hearing none, uh, nominations will be closed and this will be the slate of um, officers and directors. Um, 
at next month's meeting, they will uh, become elected by acclamation since we don't have enough people to, or anyone running against anyone else for an actual vote. So uh, many thanks to Steve Armour, who uh, is stepping off the board, who was our uh, membership chairman. He had been doing most of the work with our uh, member planet uh, membership tracking system and did uh, some wonderful things there to help us get that system cleaned up and, and move forward. Uh, Brian Hill worked with us earlier in the year uh, to help move our uh, objectives forward. And Eileen Rudstrom, who uh, has been a member for a few years and, and wonderful supporter and uh, really helped uh, bring in uh, uh, how should I say this, a, 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 a newcomer's uh, uh, perspective to what we do, which uh, she was new to the hobby. And uh, it was good, good to have fresh, uh, fresh perspective. So thank you very much for your contributions and your help over the last year. And, uh, and my many thanks to all the other officers and board members. This is this work, I, you know, you almost have to have a passion for it. It's, uh, uh, it can be time consuming and inconvenient. Uh, so many thanks to all of you for what you're doing and we'll continue to do next year. So thank you, Jeremy. I will turn it back over to you. And uh, next month we'll welcome our new slate of officers and directors. Okay, thank you, Rick. So just to echo what Rick has, has just said, um, this is a volunteer army. We all have jobs, we all have careers, we have businesses, we're all busy. So time is a, is a precious and irreplaceable commodity. So for everyone who has volunteered their time to serve on the board, as well as contribute to our society, it's not just board members, it's people who show up at our public events with telescopes, and people who man the tables and hand out brochures and, and postcards and just kind of spread the awareness of this, this hobby, you, your contributions cannot be overstated, understated. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a commitment, it's a, it's, a, it's a sacrifice, and it's also something that is deeply appreciated. And so it's a it's 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 an it's an honor and it's humbling to be a part of it. So thank you very much for your contributions. It's not easy to be a part of a of a nonprofit volunteer organization. So your your contributions are invaluable. And hey, it's got to be fun too, right? We're doing this because we're passionate about it and it's fun to to spread the awareness. So thank you very much. It's going to be another great year in 2022. So with that, uh, that brings us to tonight's program, and I will turn it over to Dr. Ann Viano to introduce tonight's speaker. So Ann, take it away. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, well, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, he is an, an associate professor of physics at Rhodes College. Um, he received his bachelor's degree in physics from Calvin College, which is now called Calvin University. And you may recognize that name if you watched with us the film Luminous uh, at our last meeting. That was the department where Professor Larry Monar uh, was doing his research and, and that was profiled in last month's movie. So tonight we get to hear from a student who uh, went to that uh, college, now university. Um, after college, Professor Rupke moved to the University of Maryland where he completed his PhD in physics. He then did a postdoc for a little while at the University of Hawaii, after which he joined us in Memphis at Rhodes College. And he does some really exciting work involving a lot of our undergraduates with cutting edge research on active galaxies. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Rupke as tonight's speaker. Well, thanks, Anne, uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all here tonight. 
uh, with other fellow astronomy um, uh, like-minded people, uh, folks who appreciate the, the beauty of the universe and uh, exploring it in different ways. Um, I, uh, I feel like my first taste of, you know, of uh, stars and galaxies came from, uh, you know, looking up, uh, I, I grew up in rural, rural Appalachia. And so, you know, I uh, spent a lot of time looking at the stars in my backyard and pulling out my dad's old telescope um, to look at things. And so that's something that still gives me a lot of joy when I get the opportunity to do so. Um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of cool to sit here and behind the scenes and, and hear what you guys are up to. It's, uh, it seems like a lot of good stuff. And um, I'm grateful for the work that you all do in the community to, to um, get people excited about, about, uh, about the universe. Um, so I'm gonna, I've got some slides for you tonight to talk about some things. Uh, let me see if I can, yes, I can. So I'm able to share that now. Uh, and you know, I'll go to the beginning of my talk. Um, so I'm going to just talk about some things that um, that I work on and uh, get a, uh, ha have an interest in in terms of uh, my 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 job. So astronomy is my job, and um, I do uh, I, I I sometimes pinch myself that I you know get to get to do that for a living. That's um, that's something that I, I really appreciate. Um, and uh, you know it's it's never too late if uh, I know I know folks in you know who as a sec as a second career have gone back to astron uh, gone back to graduate school in astronomy um, and been successful at that. In fact, I was just uh, met somebody this week who, who was doing that. So um, you know if that ever uh, <laughs> if that ever sounds sounds like something you might want to take on, uh, you know let me know. I'd be happy to chat about that. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm going to talk to you about galactic winds. This is something that I've studied since I was um, doing my PhD and something that I'm still interested in. And um, let me just dig in here. But before I do that, I, I just want to say one thing. So I was um, I was traveling this week to visit a, a, an astronomy department at the University of Wisconsin. And we we had we had a watch party so this is you know <laughs> i don't know how often this happens in academic departments but this uh so there was a release of some recommendations this week that uh, have a big that are a big deal for the astronomy community for the professional astronomy community uh and you know correspondingly for folks who you know for everyone because this is how we uh um you know the, the folks who who do the research is that's how we learn about stuff that's going on in the universe. And um, there was a report released that sets priorities for funding agencies uh, for the next decade and beyond, honestly. Uh, and um, so the, it was really interesting to see what they decided to, to prioritize. Um, uh, definitely the message came through that exoplanets, uh, looking for terrestrial, you know, trying to take spectra of um, terrestrial exoplanets. That was uh, something that they were going to focus on. Uh, but, you know, broadly, you know, all areas of astrophysics, you know, got touched on in some way, shape or form. Um, so this is a 700 page report, but there's some really good <laughs> interactive stuff that you can, uh, if you click on this link here, um, and it, just encourage you to take a look at it. It's, um, uh, this is, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, in 2020 dollars cost 10 billion, uh, 10 billion dollars, and uh, we're about to launch another 10 billion dollar great observatory. This um, this report talks about what the next one might be. Of course, it's not going to launch until the 2040s, probably. Um, but this is where these things come from as they get, you know, there's planning and there's a lot behind it. So um, this might this might interest you. Um, but to talk a little bit about science now, and, and I just want to say to please feel free to um, jump out uh, to to raise your hand or um, uh, to I don't know I guess I I can't really see people so don't raise your hand so please feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt me if you have any questions at all um, I'm more than happy to just to to slow down and to answer questions while I'm talking uh, you know I'm also happy to just talk to. Uh, 
PhDs are good at talking. <laughs> I mean, we're all we're, we're all good at talking when when we're talking. David, about a couple of us will monitor the chat too. So if somebody okay. wants to enter something in chat, we'll bring it to your attention. Okay, thanks, Rick. I appreciate that. Um, so I want to start just by talking about our view of the galaxy of of galaxies and their surroundings. Uh, so Immanuel Kant back in 1755, coined the term island universe to describe a galaxy. So, you know, our, you know, this is a very traditional picture of a galaxy, you know, going back hundreds of years, this idea that the galaxy is this island in a vast ocean of nothingness. And, uh, you know, this idea hung around for quite a while. Of course, we didn't actually know that there were other galaxies uh, until the early part of the 20th century, but you know, there was one camp that was convinced that the nebulae were uh, were ga other galaxies, and that these galaxies were you know little points in in kind of a sea of emptiness. Uh, well, in the 70s, people started to take detailed spectra of these objects called quasars. So quasars are uh, distant uh, galaxies that contain actively accreting supermassive black holes, and paradoxically, they're some of the brightest objects in the universe. Um, and when quasars were first discovered in the 60s uh, and people realized what they were, um, they started to take spectra of them. And they realized that the spectra contained lots of absorption lines. So this is a spectrum of a quasar that you can see here. And uh, each of these little uh, downward spikes is an absorption line, which means that an atom is absorbing light at that particular wavelength at a particular energy. And for most of these lines, that energy is um, perhaps one of the most uh, abundant, uh, it comes from the most abundant element in the universe, which is hydrogen. And it's sort of the most, uh, most energetic transition in, uh, yeah, you could say that in this atom, and that's uh, from the, the ground state of, of hydrogen to the first excited level. Uh, and this line is called Lyman alpha. And in the quasar, this line is redshifted because the quasar is at, a, at some, some distant place. And because the universe is expanding, uh, its wavelength is redshifted to some, to some other wavelength. And so I've represented that here in this, in this uh, figure by the red line at the right of, of the slide. And, uh, as that light comes toward us, um, it encounters gas, hydrogen gas, in between galaxies at different redshifts. And because the light is redshifting as it moves towards us, it encounters uh, uh, that, cl that cloud of, those clouds of hydrogen absorb at different wavelengths. And so you get imprinted on this, this whole slew of absorption lines uh, which are all from that Lyman alpha transition of hydrogen. And this is sometimes called the Lyman alpha forest. So this observation, uh, starting in the 70s uh, and continuing on to the present, has, you know, has shown us that, that the universe is actually filled with hydrogen gas, not just in galaxies, but actually between galaxies. Uh, and now we can also take images of this Lyman alpha uh, emission from hydrogen that's that's threading the cosmos, and this um, the, the integral the kind of the the structures of galaxies and gas that that is in between them is sometimes called the cosmic web. So if you see images um, from computer simulations of uh, the universe forming, it's it's very prominent. This idea this this kind of metaphor of a web really jumps out at you. But you can kind of imagine it in this image as well. So all of the colored blobs in this image are from Lyman alpha emission from the cosmic web at some distant, um, distant redshift. Uh, so we have instruments now that can image this Lyman alpha uh, in between galaxies. And this hydrogen is incredibly diffuse. Uh, you know, we're talking, um, fractions of a particle, particle per cubic centimeter. Uh, and so, uh, so there's not much of it, uh, relatively speaking, but you know, there's a lot of volume out there. So you, when you put it all together, you can see it. So 
so kind of moving to you know the latter part of the 20th century uh several hundred years after kant we realized that okay galaxies are islands but they're in this sea of of hydrogen gas and then that actually might be 90 percent of the visible matter in the universe is in this intergalactic medium not just galaxies um what we can also see in this spectrum are absorption lines not just from hydrogen but also from um elements uh, heavier elements this uh these little cutouts from the spectrum and if you focus on the red dips here those are absorption lines from oxygen atoms uh, from oxygen atoms that have been ionized five times so they've lost five electrons and uh, this oxygen obs the observation of this oxygen tells us that not only is there hydrogen there but there's also heavy elements well heavy elements are not the original products of the big bang so heavy elements, anything heavier than hydrogen, helium, or lithium was created uh, in stars or through, through stellar processes in some way, shape, or form. Uh, stars are only exist inside galaxies. So somehow the stuff outside of the stuff inside of galaxies has reached out into the intergalactic medium and actually fills the intergalactic medium. Um, so, uh, here we have, <laughs> I'm representing these heavy elements, uh, and when I say heavy here, I mean heavier than hydrogen, which is not that heavy, but, um, but, but there you go, uh, is represented by the shark here. And so swimming in this intergalactic medium, we have the fish of, you know, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, the building blocks for life, right. But also for everything else, um, for, for planets, for asteroids, um, for new stars as well. And perhaps 75% 70 of the heavy elements, uh, elements heavier than hydrogen and helium are actually also in this intergalactic medium. So the question is, how did it get there? And if it was created inside galaxies, it has to you know, get out into the intergalactic medium somehow. And um, so that's where galactic winds come in. Uh, and this is an image, uh, kind of a classic image of a nearby galaxy group, the M81, M82 group, perhaps one that you all have imaged <laughs> with your with your um, uh, with your cameras. Uh, and M82 actually is a is a classic example of a beautiful superwind. So this is a gas that has um, been blown out of the galaxy by energy that is produced through uh, dying stars. Um, and in other galaxies, you also have out, uh, galactic winds that get uh, blown out of the galaxy by accreting supermassive black holes. And so if you look at, if you look at M82 here, uh, the disk of the galaxy is this kind of yellow um, uh, cigar shape, kind of moving from the upper left to the lower right. And the wind is this other bluer thing here. Okay. Um, so uh, and I'm showing it in this particular view for a reason, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, so galactic winds uh, are one mechanism by which these metals can escape galaxies and enter the intergalactic medium. Um, and we know now that these galactic winds are ubiquitous in galaxies that have active star formation and accreting supermassive black holes. But there's a question uh, as to um, how far these galactic winds actually reach into uh, the circum into the intergalactic medium. Um, so uh, one uh, one other thing that we can do is um, we can uh, associate we, to, to see where these metals are. Uh, so one thing I haven't told you, this image of a quasar here actually also contains two galaxies. So this, this little blob right above the quasar is, is a galaxy that's between us and the quasar, as is this galaxy here. And it turns out that if we look at how far away those galaxies are, um, they correspond to the, the distances 
of these absorption lines in oxygen. So it tells us that the oxygen that we're seeing here is actually surrounding these foreground galaxies that you see in this image, this one here and this one here. So uh, if we look at a lot of quasar sight lines, we take a lot of spectra like this, and we can sort of do a statistical analysis and infer that many of these galaxies actually have big reservoirs of heavy elements surrounding them. And uh, this has led to uh, sort of a, the coining of a new term called the circumgalactic medium. So this idea that galaxies, uh, so there's the intergalactic medium that kind of threads the cosmic web. And then each galaxy also has a big reservoir of, of gas and metals surrounding it. Um, that's well outside the disk of the galaxy, sort of the stellar body of the galaxy, um, but uh, is sort of within the gravitational influence of that galaxy. And these, these uh, halos around galaxies, this circumgalactic medium may actually contain a lot of, uh, you know, again, sort of like the intergalactic medium contains a lot of the metals and, and the gas uh, in sort of the, the system of each galaxy. So our modern picture of, of galaxies is that, you know, no galaxy is an island. So there's this communal, communal ecosystem in which we have, you know, galaxies that are interacting very, um, very, um, very vigorously with their surroundings. So uh, they have outflows that, that expel gas. Uh, some of that gas actually recycles and falls back onto the galaxy. Um, there is gas that's accreting from the intergalactic medium uh, and that accreting gas powers new star formation and black hole activity. Um, but, uh, you know, these scales are on, you know, the, all this activity is happening on, on scales much larger than the galaxy itself. And uh, so that brings me back to this image I showed you earlier. So I showed you this, um, this outflow from this galaxy M82. Um, I think it's sometimes called the cigar galaxy, which is where that uh, cigar shape came to mind. Um, the size of this galaxy is about 10 kiloparsecs. Um, and just a reminder that parsec is the, is the distance to the nearest star. Uh, so 10 kiloparsecs is 10,000 times that. Um, our galaxy is actually bigger than M82. M82 is a dwarf galaxy, surprisingly. Um, uh, but, uh, but that aside, this is sort of a, a typical size for a galactic wind that we observe, 10 kiloparsecs. Uh, but um, the scale of the circumgalactic medium for many of these galaxies is much larger than that. Um, so for instance, the, uh, the circumgal circumgalactic medium of these two galaxies is probably more like, you know, at least the size of 100 kiloparsecs uh, and, and perhaps larger than that. So, you know, the wind is kind of a little part of this galactic ecosystem, but we don't really see it extending uh, well out into the circumgalactic medium where it needs to, to, to pollute this uh, sort of this ga galactic halo with, with gas and with heavy elements. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we can, how we uh, are trying to observe that. Um, but first I want to show you uh, a couple of computer simulations. So what's great, one great thing about modern astrophysics is that, um, is the power of modern computer simulations to, to recreate the evolution of the universe. Um, so in some sense, uh, you know, I'm an observer, I work with data um, from telescopes and um, I, uh, you know, those are the ex quote unquote experiments that I do. But in some sense, uh, computer, simulator, computer simulators are also running experiments too with, with physics in, you know, they put the physics into the computers and the astrophysics into the, into the computer simulations. And then we compare, what do the simulations say? What do the, what do the observations say? And that can help us refine our understanding of both. Um, so they're really key to, to interpreting data in, in, in modern astrophysics. Um, and this is a little bit of a complicated uh, plot here, but I, th I think a, a com complicated figure, complicated slide, but I think it's worth spending just a little bit of time on because this is a fairly 
typical um, uh, computer simulation of the evolution of, of the galaxy. Uh, and what's happening here is this is cosmic time is, is proceeding from the top to the bottom. So the present day is the bottom row here. And the top row is, you know, 10 billion years in the past, probably. So, you know, much closer to the, the beginning of the universe than the, than the present day. And the, the different columns here uh, on the left is the density of the gas. And what you're seeing there uh, is the collapse of the cosmic web as structures form in the universe. So uh, at the top, you see these very filamentary things. Uh, and this is, this is um, something that astronomers call hierarchical structure formation. So, so small, small things start to collapse under, under gravity uh, early in the universe. And then those sm smaller things collapse to form larger things and so on. And so in the end, we end up with one galaxy that's you know, coalesced at the center of this, this box here. Um, but part of why I wanna show you this is because on the right, um, in the middle column and the right column, what you're seeing there is the temperature of the intergalactic and circumgalactic medium and the amount of heavy elements that exist. And so you can see that early in the universe, um, the heavy elements are really concentrated at the center of this image. But in the present day, these heavy elements represented by the different colors are spread throughout this box. Okay, so that those are the observations I was talking about earlier. Is that this you know the simulation is consistent with what we see, and that um, there's heavy elements everywhere. And in the simulations, the key to making that happen is outflows. Uh, and uh, in the, the middle there is is just showing that, um, that there's also a lot of hot gas, uh, a lot of hot air that comes out of these uh, galaxies and pollutes the circumgalactic and intergalactic medium. Uh, but within that, there are these sort of clumps, these little dark clumps, which are cooler, cooler clouds of gas. Um, and just kind of zooming in on those details just a little bit more. Uh, so if we go to the next slide here, this is kind of zooming into that box. And the colors here are telling you where the gas uh, in this, in the circumgalactic medium around this particular galaxy has come from. And the, the blue, is coming from accretion. So, so the intergalactic medium is uh, the gravity of this galaxy is pulling in gas from the intergalactic medium. Uh, the brown streaks are actually outflows from other galaxies that are entering this, the, the gravitational influence of this galaxy. And then the green stuff, which is kind of covered over by some of it, is the stuff that, that I'm interested in. So that's the the outflow that's coming from the galaxy itself and, and spreading out to pollute the, the circumgalactic medium. So do we see that? That's the question. That's the big question. So I, you know, I've worked on this stuff since, since my dissertation. And uh, one of the big questions has always been, how big are these things? You know, how far do they reach? Uh, because you know, there's a lot of reasons why um, outflows probably do, you know, inject gas into the intergalactic and circumgalactic medium. But seeing them do so is, is hard. Uh, so as in, um, as in astrophotography, you know, a lot of discovery is driven by new, uh, new instruments and new technologies. And uh, so one, uh, one kind of big uh, big thing that's been happening over the last decade in astronomy is um, sort of more sensitive, wider field, wider field of view um, imaging spectrographs. So I use these things called integral field spect spectrographs, which allow you to take a spectrum uh, at lots of different positions around a galaxy. And these things have been getting bigger and more sensitive over time, which allows us to look for the signs of these ones. Okay. Uh, so I want to tell you about one particular galaxy that we've looked at, um, and I'm just showing some pictures here of, of some of my some of the folks who were uh, involved in this. Uh, Allison is at um, UC San Diego. Uh, Jim Geach is at uh, uh, Hertfordshire in the UK, and Christy actually I was just visiting at Wisconsin um, at Wisconsin Madison, and then other folks at, at various institutions. Some of these are folks at liberal arts colleges, just like Rhodes. Um, 
And uh, so we went and observed this particular galaxy, uh, which is a compact star forming galaxy at a look back time of several billion, several billion years, um, uh, which means that you know, it, uh, the light we're seeing from this galaxy left it several bi billion years ago. And uh, this galaxy was interesting for, for a number of reasons. We already knew it had an outflow, uh, but we sort of wanted to, to explore the properties of this outflow more. Uh, but what we didn't expect is that this um, galaxy would be surrounded by this enormous nebula of, of gas that is emitting in the light of uh, oxygen, singly ionized oxygen in a particular emission line. And what's really striking here is that this nebula is, is 20 times the size of uh, what sort of the scale of the galaxy itself. Um, and uh, so in other words, it's reaching well into the circumgalactic medium. Uh, so this was this was really exciting. I mean, the, and it's um, not something we realized right away. So we looked at this galaxy, and uh, we didn't. Again, because this was a new instrument, and it had such a bigger field of view than what I was used to, um, we kind of looked at it, and, and I still had my mind in the older instruments I was using, and I was like, okay, well that doesn't seem that big. Um, you know, it's probably this is probably due to some sort of you know interaction. We hadn't matched up. The, the old images we had with the new images. And um, we sort of put it aside. And then a, a month or two later, my collaborator said, you know, I, I feel like there was something interesting about that. Um, you should really go take a second look and uh, reduce that data. Um, and so I did so. And then uh, I realized, oh, the scale uh, that I was assuming is all wrong. And when we finally put the scales, the images together properly, I kind of I had to do what you know what scientists call a sanity check. I had to like you know double check my work or triple check. <laughs> I wasn't sure it was right. Uh, so to see this enormous nebula was really really exciting, and the shape of it is very striking. Uh, so it it looks like a wind. So any of the um, any of the winds that I have studied have this sort of classic shape of an hourglass uh, that, that is sort of uh, bisymmetric. Uh, and one of my collaborators uh, pointed out that it looks a lot like um, the hourglass planetary nebula. And if you, in fact, if you line these two things up, they, you know, they, they actually, you know, if you overlay them one on top of the other, they, <laughs> they really do look a lot alike uh, morphologically. Of course, we can see the hourglass nebula a lot better because it's uh, a lot closer to us. And what's kind of cool is that they have the same angular scale. So the hourglass nebula extends up for about 17 arc seconds, just like um, this galaxy that we looked at. Uh, but the physical scale is about a million times different. Um, so sort of an example of the universe, you know, showing us some of the same things uh, on very different scales. Um, I should also mention that one of my collaborators, this was Jim Geach, he, um, he, uh, uh, encourage us to name the galaxy. <laughs> so this is not something that we typically do, um, just because there are so many galaxies and you can't name them all. But uh, he suggested the name Makani, uh, which is since we had observed this galaxy from uh, from Mauna Kea, which is in Hawaii, um, he suggested that we give it the name, uh, the Hawaiian name for wind. Uh, and uh, it also turns out this is also the Hawaiian name for breaking wind which my, uh, my children think is, <laughs> is hilarious. They like to tell, uh, tell their friends that their dad studies um, uh, galaxies breaking winds. Uh, so good, uh, good elementary school humor. Um, so, uh, so anyway, how do we really know this is a wind though? And to do that, we have to look at the velocities, uh, and the speeds of, of what's going on. And what we did is actually, we looked at the stars and, and, and the speeds of, of the wind. And this is an image of, of this, the speeds that we can measure for this gas. And the, the darker purple here represents really high speeds and the lighter purple is kind of lower speeds. And um, you can see the, you know, it's pretty obvious that for the most part, the low speed stuff is on the outskirts and the high speed stuff is really in the center. And um, 
it turns up turns out that that lines up well with what we know about when the stars formed in this galaxy. So um, there was an episode of star formation, of intense star formation about 400 mega years ago, at least from the perspective of this galaxy. Um, of course, that light has been traveling to us for billions of years. So it was that plus 400 mega years ago from our perspective. Um, but the wind that's very slow has that has had time to reach, reach this large radius and slow down. So it kind of is consistent with that. Um, whereas the very high velocity stuff um, is probably due to a starburst that was only seven mega years ago. So very recent um, in, in sort of the, uh, basically it just happened. Um, and so the wind is still very fast. It has really just, just gotten outside of the galaxy. Um, and there are other reasons why this is sort of, this is all kind of holds together. Um, so this is cool. This is really exciting to kind of put all, put these pieces together. And, um, and, and again, the result is really that we're seeing something, you know, for one of the, I mean, I would say the first time in my experience, um, you know, we always had to say to say the first time ever, right? Because there's always exceptions, but uh, uh, you know, really a solid example of a galaxy blowing stuff out, blowing metals out into the circum into its circumgalactic medium, consistent with the story that I've been telling you that there's stuff out there, it has to get out there through outflows. We just need to be seeing it happening. And so through this sort of, through these sort of new sensitive instruments, we can do that. Um, and to kind of uh, connect it with that simulation I showed you earlier, if we plop Makani down on that simulation, sure enough, it falls right inside that that bubble, um, that green bubble of, um, of stuff that the simulation says should, should come from the wind. Okay, um, I just want to take a few more minutes and tell you, uh, I believe Anne or, or someone earlier mentioned the James Webb Space Telescope. So this is another, this is a thing that, um, that, that I'm really involved. Uh, I mean, I'm just a small piece of, <laughs> of a really big pie. Um, and not even a piece of the pie. I'm like a crumb in the, in the huge pie, the huge apple pie of, of James Webb. But uh, um, I was fortunate to be part of a team that's uh, gonna get some of the first data. Uh, and so we're eagerly, we've been preparing, um, preparing for the launch and are um, by getting our, our tool belt ready um, and are eagerly, eagerly awaiting it. Um, so James Webb, th there's a fun, if you go to the, the website now, there's a fun countdown now that you can uh, watch. This is actually a, uh, from a couple of days ago, so now I think it's only 42 days away. <laughs> uh, but I'm definitely um, keeping an eye on this. And uh, I mean, this is just an amazing engineering uh, and engineering feat. I um, I have nothing but the greatest respect for all the folks who have been working so hard on this for for decades. Um, and uh, you know, it feels a little bit cheating to kind of come in at the end and. Uh, swoop in and get to work on it but it's uh it's it's really a privilege um and of course there are lots and lots of astronomers who are going to get their hands on this data um but what's cool here is that there are two uh for the first time uh on, on a big mission like this we're flying these imaging spectrometers these integral field spectrographs or integral field units um and these are things that are becoming more and more common in astronomy but um, there are a lot of astronomers who don't sort of have a lot of experience with, use, with using them. Uh, but this is kind of something that's been in my toolbox for a long time. I've, I've been, uh, you know, have been interested in using these things back when I was a, a graduate student. And so um, it was something I um, really pursued as a postdoc. And uh, um, now it's kind of, it can apply that expertise uh, to this, this new data from the James Webb Space Telescope. And so I'm part of a, a team uh, that's led by a PI at um, Heidelberg in Germany. Uh, and we're basically, and so, so I'm the software lead for this team. So I'm, we're getting some early data, but in return, we're producing some software that for the community that they're gonna use uh, to help, help them uh, fully utilize these integral field spectrographs. Um, so here's a picture of Dominica. She is the lead, and then these are just some grad students and postdocs who are working on this project. Um, but there's uh, the, the other two PIs um, are 
our professor at James at Johns Hopkins, Nadia Sakomska, and uh, professor at University of Maryland, uh, who is actually my PhD supervisor. So he and I still collaborate on things. Um, and uh, so with undergraduates at Rhodes, we've been working hard on uh, the sort of software product for the community. And uh, when, the, when the, the observatory launches about six months after that, we'll start getting our data um, from our project. And the data we're getting is of three distant quasars. And so we, uh, this is so it's kind of a, a grab bag of images here uh, and a little bit, uh, I won't uh, bore you with unpacking all this, but the basic idea is we know these galaxies have these um, outflows, uh, but we don't actually know a lot about them because it's really hard to see these, see what's going on with these things at higher redshift. Uh, so these are distant quasars. Um, and, but with James Webb, uh, we have these new, um, again, uh, you know, we have a space, an enormous space-based observatory that's going to get um, awesome spatial information about these galaxies, but also tell us what's going on in different, uh, in different ways about how the gas is, is moving through the galaxies. So, um, so this is, you know, I'm sure whatever we will learn about these will be uh, surprising and, and interesting. Um, and uh, again, this is this um, software product that I was talking to you about. Uh, so, you know, I'm an astronomer, but, you know, modern astronomers are also, <laughs> you know, regardless of whether you're a, an observer or a simulator or a, even a theorist, um, at some level, you're also a, a coder, um, you know, sometimes a software engineer, um, a, a statistician. Um, so there's lots of this, sort of these uh, skills you have to have in your toolbox. Um, so I've been learning over the last year uh, about collaborative uh, software production, <laughs> uh, which has been been a been a, a fun uh, a fun thing to do, um, and a, you know working with a great team. Um, so I'm going to finish there. Uh, been talking long enough, I think, <laughs> and I would just uh, invite you uh, to ask any questions you might have. Okay, thank you very much, David. That's excellent presentation. I know we got a couple here in the chat, but before I address those, sure. does anyone else have any questions? We'll just kind of open it up here. I know I've got a few. As I, I do, Jeremy. <clears throat> so as you were describing how the, I mean, I guess there are other mechanisms for this for these metals and heavier elements to get out into the intergalactic media yes no is it so um there um there are other processes uh in some environments so um there are lots of um many galaxies live in dense environments um, like groups and clusters. So for instance, the Milky Way is part of the local group of galaxies. Uh, it's, it and Andromeda are like the, the, big, the big players in the local group. Um, right. there's lots, it's mostly smaller galaxies, but um, if in, in the very dense environments uh, like clusters of galaxies, so the nearest cluster of galaxies is called the Virgo cluster. Um, and the local group may actually be gravitationally bound to the Virgo cluster, I can't remember. Um, but uh, in those big clusters, uh, because there is so much gas within the cluster, there you have actually something called the intracluster medium, and that's denser than the intergalactic medium. And it's dense enough that when galaxies, uh, and galaxies are moving very fast through these clusters, right. so that that medium can actually strip the gas from the galaxy. Right. Um, Via uh, via what's what's called ram pressure, uh, so the pressure of the gas uh, interacting with the gas in the galaxy um, can can basically strip the gas, and so that's another way that you can get metals in the intracluster medium. I would have never thought of any of this had you not started talking about it, but it's intriguing to think about. Well, well most of this stuff I didn't think of either, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm. Uh, you know, I mean, that's the great thing about science, right? Is it's lots of people working on this stuff over decades, and it's a, it's a you know, an accumulative body of knowledge. Uh, 
So Jim Geach, um, I think he did the Eagle simulation, didn't he? Along with Rob Crane. There's so the Eagle simulations were done by a European group. So Jim's not a simulator, um, but uh, so I don't think he was involved in that. Um, but yeah, Eagle, so you identified Eagle. Eagle's uh, one of the big sort of suites, modern suites of um, cosmological simulations um, where they try to simulate the evolution of galaxies like this at high resolution. Um, yeah. Not only galaxies, but clusters, right? I mean, we're talking um, millions of light years. I, I forget what the, the dimensions are, but uh, the formation of several galaxies. Yeah, galaxies right, run. right. So, so these com cosmo cosmological simulations, yeah, you don't simulate the whole universe, right? You simulate a box of, that's a small, a very small part of the universe, but um, but that small part could still be very large. So it might encompass, yeah, many clusters, many certainly many galaxies. Um, right. And what they do now is uh, they simulate, they do those big simulations and then they actually use that as a framework to do something called a zoom in simulation where um, they sort of rerun part of that simulation, but just a small part of that box, but a much higher spatial resolution. Um, so, you know, whatever you're doing, you're limited by uh, your computing power. And so you can apply your computing power to that large box, but your sort of spatial resolution of the universe is only so big. And so a lot of the physics and astrophysics gets lost in those big spatial boxes. Um, so if you do what's called a zoom in simulation, then you can sort of, at least for one of those galaxies, say you can try to resolve a lot of more of the physics that's going on. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't do any of this stuff. I just sort of, you know, hear about it at conferences and, uh, um, so I, I think I'm describing it correctly, but. Uh, <laughs> well, I think there's part of the Eagle simulation that actually does simulate the formation of one galaxy where you have a Milky Way like galaxy. Yeah. Where you have, um, you know, the supermassive black hole forming and then the, 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 the gas essentially accreting around it, similar to the way our solar system formed. I think I'm oversimplifying it here, but um, you actually see part of the simulation where the, the gas around and then um, the, the, the structure. Um, begins to form yeah and... i mean yeah and you fit on something i mean it, it, what's amazing is that these uh, processes happen at all sorts of different scales in the universe uh, but you see the same sorts of things right i mean there's discs everywhere there's discs around stars there's discs around um around black holes there's discs that are galaxies um there might even be you know discs of satellite galaxies around galaxies so it's <laughs> So it's sort of turtles on turtles, if you will. Right. Um, How yeah. accurate are, I mean, it's an intriguing simulation because you see a, from a visual perspective, the formation of either a single galaxy or a structure of galaxies. But I would imagine the amount, the parameters and the, um, yeah, the, the simulation time and uh, the, the very, into uh, a simulation like that has just got to be warm. so and um an experiment but um yeah i, I um I don't, i'm not going to say i question the accuracy but I'm, I'm intrigued by what i see because it uh well first of all it's very visually appealing but there's always a part of me that thinks okay is this is this really how it works or are we still trying to plug in the holes are we still trying to figure it out as far as the um the formation of of large scale structure and, uh, and also the formation of galaxies. Um, it's kind of the chicken egg argument. Do we, do we start with a black hole and then the galaxy forms around it or does the galaxy form and then the black hole forms as the galaxy is forming? So um, I guess my question is, do you need a supermassive black hole in order for a galaxy to form? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, and uh... I think the answer is no, but if I knew the answer, then I would probably be writing a paper about it because um, I don't think we know the answer yet. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Be writing your Nobel uh, acceptance uh, letter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe, yeah, I, I don't know. 
don't know if it's Nobel Prize winning, but it would certainly be important enough. Yeah, definitely. The other question I had was the mechanism that drives these galactic winds. I mean, you're talking several thousands of, of um, parsecs, you know, several kiloparsecs. And I guess the analogy that I draw in my mind is a, a supernova, a, a star that explodes. I mean, it collapses and then it rebounds. And I guess the mechanism for a type two supernova would be the, um, you know, the collapsing core that, that then bounces and, and rebounds back into the expanding envelope. And that's what drives the, uh, you know, the, the envelope of the star back out into the medium. But for, the, for these galactic winds, um, what is the mechanism that's driving these, these gases and these metals to be driven so far away from their host galaxies? I mean, several thousands of parsecs, kiloparsecs. Um, is, yeah. it, is it from matter that's falling onto a supermassive black hole? Or is it the, um, the galaxy? So, so one mechanism is, um, is what you identified is all the energy. So, so paradoxically, right, black holes are, are you know, surrounded by materials that's glowing um, and you know, incredibly bright. So there's a lot of energy that gets liberated uh, when stuff falls onto a black hole or falls near a black hole. Um, and so all that energy can then enter the, the gas surrounding it and um, you know, blow up like a balloon. Uh, stars also, when they die, uh, well, stars have stellar winds. So our, um, our sun has a stellar wind and uh, it actually blows a big bubble um, around the solar system. So, you know, uh, you put a bunch of stellar winds together uh, and, then, and then you combine that with stars that explode and eject matter uh, and energy uh, into the, the areas around them. Uh, that's a lot of energy. And so when you put all that together, you get a lot of stars forming. You can actually do a lot of work with that and uh, blow some big bubbles. Um, the Milky Way actually has its own galactic wind. Uh, so this was a, um, I mean, people knew about this for some time, but it, I think it was sort of brought home with a really dramatic discovery by um, a gamma ray space telescope uh, about a decade ago. And these are some, sometimes called the Fermi bubbles. And so the, there are these two, you see these two amazing structures in gamma rays surrounding uh, the center of the galaxy uh, or on either, you know, a bisymmetric structure on either side of the, the galaxy's center. So even the, even the Milky Way, which, you know, currently has a pretty low rate of star formation and doesn't have an active black hole, um, has somehow driven this wind out. And so maybe there was some black hole activity in the past that did this, or you know, the star formation rate was a little higher. Um, so uh, you know, it, it may be that lots of galaxies have these sorts of things, but they're biggest and strongest when you have a lot of energy that's coming out from the formation of stars or from black holes accreting matter at the centers. So uh, do we know the star formation rate for Makani? Yeah, that's a good question. It's about, um, so, so for reference, the Milky Way is forming stars at about one, uh, one sun per year. Um, and so not that it forms, you know, uh, you know, a star with the mass of the sun every year. It's, it's you know, this is sort of averaged over time. This is what it does. So Makani's current star formation rate is about 100 to 200 solar masses per year. Um, so it's about, you know, one to 200 times the, the the mass of the sun uh, per year. And, um, you know, comparatively, probably the, you know, the most, the, the biggest star formation rates we've measured in the universe are up to, you know, sort of one about 10 times that. So a thousand to 2000 solar masses per year. So, you know, you're getting up there at 100 to 200. Those are, those are the biggest star formation rates, 100 to 200 solar masses per year that we measure in the local universe. Um, the highest star formation rates you don't see, you, you really only see when you're at um, sort of the area, the era of the universe's peak star formation, which was about, occurred when the universe was about half its present age. Right. Um, and so the, now we're kind of in the, in the doldrums, the, the universe's star formation rate overall has declined quite a bit and it's gonna keep going down. 
And can you compare that to what the mass outflow rate would be? Or, yeah, that's a great question. And that's actually one a question that um, astronomers often ask in, in terms of trying to understand the impact of these winds. Um, so it turns out that the mass outflow rate for this uh, outflow is, uh, at least for the episode two that I talked about, um, is probably comparable to the star formation rate. Um, so that means that, uh, you know, it might uh, act as a negative feedback on the star formation in the sense that, you know, as the star formation goes up, the outflow blows the gas out that causes the star formation. And so you, the star formation eventually will end up declining because of that. It's a good question. Dave, I have a question that just occurred to me after sure. teaching this for so many years, but yeah. are there magnetic fields on a galactic scale that could re be responsible for some of these outflow winds? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so <laughs> it's funny, simulations of galactic winds over the years have always said, well, what if we add magnetic fields? Uh, <laughs> I remember in graduate school, that was kind of a joke. Uh, you know, we, uh, in my uh, first graduate school office, there was a, um, <laughs> there was a sheet of paper on the wall that said questions you can ask any speaker. And it was, you know, things like, you know, have you heard about the recent Russian results or, and one of them was, uh, you know, have you thought about magnetic fields? And <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, magnetic fields are, turn out to be hard to measure in galaxies. Um, but they could be really important, right? Uh, not just for galaxies, but for planet formation and all sorts of things. Um, so magnetic fields are sort of one of those things that are probably important, but are always kind of difficult to wrestle with. Uh, so people have included them in simulations and, um, you know, it's thought that they uh, could be important in sort of regulating the evolution of, of the winds. Um, it's not clear that they relate to the power source, uh, except that, um, cosmic rays or relativistic protons uh, are now thought to be a possible sort of, uh, uh, you know, they may help to power these winds and cosmic rays couple strongly to magnetic fields. So, um, so yeah, probably that matters. <laughs> um, one really cool recent result actually, um, so I showed you that M82 wind, um, recently an observatory called SOFIA. So this is a, um, a instrument mounted on uh, an airplane that flies around um, and which allows it to get above sort of, you know, it gets into the, uh, some maybe the upper stratosphere or something, I don't know. But um, yeah, in fact, the S in Sophia is stratospheric, so it must be <laughs> in the stratosphere, but uh, you can do better infrared observations that way. And um, they have, have an instrument which can map magnetic fields better than we have before. And so there's some, one of the actually really dramatic uh, discoveries from Sophia has been some beautiful maps of um, magnetic fields in galaxies, including the magnetic fields in the M82 wind. Um, so your question actually makes me wanna go back and look at that and uh, dig into more than just the, um, just the image itself, which is quite beautiful. <laughs> so yeah, good question. I might have time for one more question. Um, and then- Do you have uh, any other questions? Yeah. So James Webb, what excites you the most about its potential as far as breakthrough? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. Um, well, from a galaxy evolution perspective, I mean, of course, I'm excited about what it's gonna show, you know, uh, what I'm gonna learn about feedback from studying all these galaxies. Um, uh, you know, galaxies that I know and love, and uh, now we're going to learn a lot more about them. Um, so, you know, that excites me just as, as a researcher, but as sort of, a, um, you know, someone who, you know, gets excited about, you know, all the sort of cool things in the universe. Um, I think, you know, probably the things that excite me most are the things that I don't know what to expect. Um, you know, those are the, the surprises that we find out that we just don't know ahead of time. Um, I, I think the, the things we'll learn about exoplanets and some of the first galaxies are perhaps, you know, th those are probably going to be the most dramatic things. That would be my guess. Um, but we'll see, you know. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, you think of the Hubble Space Telescope, they just 
park it at one section of the sky where there's doesn't seem to be anything going on let it sit there and collect photons for two weeks and we get the hubble deep field and confirmation that the universe is full of galaxies so yeah no i mean you think about how transformative the hubble space telescope has been not just for astronomy but for i mean humanity at large in terms of its connection to the cosmos and uh you know, at least if you scale by the amount of money spent on James Webb, <laughs> you know, you can hope that it will be uh, similarly transformative, but, uh, you know, time will tell. Yeah, no doubt we'll be looking back five, 10 years from now, maybe maybe sooner at some major breakthrough that, that comes out of the James Webb. So it's yeah. exciting that you get to work on that. I'm not sure if I, if I love you or if I hate you because you get paid to do astronomy for a living and I'm just very envious. So it's, it's, it's a great profession. You know, I'm, I, I think it's fantastic. You're on the cutting edge of just some incredible research and we're just sitting back and waiting. So it's, it's great. Yeah. What you want to yeah. bet they checked the shape of the mirror about a hundred different times before they packed it up to send it off. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I've talked with um, um, he, hearing John Mather, who's the, uh, the senior project scientist for James Webb. Um, he, I mean, he, he talks about, he came and visited Rhodes and uh, he talked about um, how, yeah, with Hubble, right, they, they, um, they got the mirror, uh, they, the mirror shape wrong because they, the same instrument that they used to, to create them, you know, the shape of the mirror is the same one they used to test the shape of the mirror. So he said, you know, we didn't make that mistake again. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. lessons learned well we'll all be holding our collective breath for a while yeah. while it launches and deploys it's going to this is going to be a process right to get it out there it's, it's not going to happen overnight this is a like a 29 day journey or something like that yeah i think there'll be probably a lot of sleepless nights for some folks but uh yeah. but hoping for the best certainly absolutely anybody the else any other questions? rockets i mean one of uh Musk's rockets. Who's 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 launching? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Yeah, I didn't hear the question. Um, this is uh, actually the European Space Agency is launching it. So this is uh, an Ar Ariane Five rocket. Um, yeah. And so these are well tested, you know. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Been launched a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, all right. Well, thank you very much, David. This was a very informative presentation. Um, yeah. I'll have to watch it again to process it, but yeah. excellent. So well, I really appreciate you inviting me. And uh, yeah, it was great to uh, at least meet some of you all virtually and, and also, again, hear about some of the great stuff you guys are doing. So, uh, so thanks. Thank you, David. Mutual. It was wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Okay. With that, let's uh, I'm go ahead and wrap up here just briefly. So let's see here. So again, there's our details. Check out our website and as well as Facebook and uh, YouTube. And uh, that's pretty much it. If you're not on our email list already, you can either go to our website, memphisastro.org, or you can go to joinmas.com. Tomorrow night, Village Creek. This is a big one. We haven't done this in two years. This is um, this is our major outreach event. Weather looks good. We'll send the final notice out tomorrow morning. But uh, so far, so good. So just kind of plan on it. So again, we're going to be meeting about 5.30, 6 o'clock at Delta Q for, for dinner if you're interested. Otherwise, just be at the Visitor Center at Village Creek State Park near Wynn, Arkansas, just before 7 o'clock and should be a, a great outreach event. So keep an eye on your email. And with that, I will go ahead and wrap up. And Rick, do you have anything else? I do not. Okay, excellent. Very no, good. That's 930. And uh, don't forget, we fall back this weekend as well. Not tonight, but tomorrow night. So you go to Village Creek, you're hanging out, you want an extra hour of observing, set your clocks back and uh, just enjoy it. Or you can sleep in Sunday morning. So with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Everybody have a great night and we will see you hopefully tomorrow night. Take care. Good night, everybody.